different categories of healthcare systems. Um, we're also going to be talking about some uh, legal terminology, uh, organization. Um, so we're going to be touching upon different topics today. Um, so we're going to be constantly shifting gears as we go along. I'm also going to be introducing some communication dynamics uh, before you guys go home for the holiday. All right, so let's talk about healthcare systems. Um, you got four basic types of hospitals. Now keep in mind that they are not exclusive to the different categories. There can be some overlap and there can be some, some uh, hybridness to it. So the first one we're going to be talking about here is uh, Veterans Administration. This is government owned. Uh, this is generally where your uh, military and a former military go. Then you got number two and number three. This is where, what we're going to be talking about for the most part of the remainder uh, of the course are not-for-profit and for-profit organizations. Now what not-for-profit organizations are these are generally affiliated with your uh, religious religious groups. Um, you also have some privately owned groups too that are not for profit, but they're mostly associated with religious groups such as the, the Catholic Sisters, like your St. Jude's, your St. Joseph's. You also got your Adventist hospitals such as Loma Linda, White Memorial. Uh, but these particular hospitals, uh, because they're called not for profit, they, they are actually making money. They're making money, but the money that they make goes back into the hospital to develop new programs or provide new services for the community, or the money that they make goes into community services, like health fairs, uh, breast awareness, um, diabetes, um, Birth, birth control programs. So it goes back into the community. So again, money is being generated, but it goes back. Back to the hospital, back to the community. Okay? Unlike your for-profit uh, for organizations, for proprietary, these are organizations where the money is generated and it goes into the investors. Okay. There are some pros and cons for both not-for-profit and for-profit uh, for um, organizations. Now, with proprietary types of organizations, again, it is investor-owned. It could be a group or conglomerate of individuals, or it can be owned by physicians themselves. Again, they are operated for the financial benefit of the individual or the corporation. Now. <clears throat> For profit organizations, this is where some of the, the uh, conflict occurs. Because the, the main key here, main objective here is to generate a profit, they may take some programs or services that doesn't benefit them. I'm not talking about the community, I'm talking about the business. All right, so you have this business there may be a need for a certain service, but if it's not generating any kind of money, he might dismantle that. And I see that happening all the time with physician-owned proprietary. So they'll start taking services away, even though the community may need it. But they're losing money out of this, so they get rid of it. Okay, so that's where the problem occurs. All right, any questions with not-for-profit or for-profit? Okay. Again, they're both generating money. One goes back to the hospital and the community, and the other goes into the pockets of the, the investors and owners. All right, then you have your systems and network. This is where a group practices together in one organization. A good example of that would be Kaiser. Okay, it's, a Kaiser owns its own staff, it owns its own physician, they have their own insurances. Okay. They're essentially one entity. And again, it can fall into the category of a for-profit organization. So there's some overlap there. Okay, are you guys familiar with Kaiser? Okay, it's one of the bigger organizations out there. You got Kaiser, you got Humana, you got Tenet. These are all different systems and networks. Okay, 
All right. So you have your hospitals, you have your clinics. Now your clinics is going to be a smaller, smaller outfit. They're not going to have all the services a hospital would, would offer. These are generally, um, they exist for non-emergent type of procedures. Generally you walk in, you walk in, you walk out. Okay, non-emergent. Clinics uh, exist outside of the facility or separate from the facility, um, usually located near the doctor's office. The clinics themselves may be a specialty. So you have orthopedic clinics, you have urology clinics, you have cardiology clinics, but they're very specific to the specific needs of the individuals. Okay, so they are separate from the hospitals, yes. Would an urgent care be considered a clinic? An urgent care can be considered a clinic, yes. Okay. All right. So we have independent facilities who are a group of practice together in one organization. Again, we talked about this with Kaiser. You have mental health facilities where they provide medical care, nursing services, and intensive supervision to chronically mentally ill, mentally disordered, or other mentally incompetent persons. Now, I'm just going to spend a little bit of time on this because I have my own uh, opinions about the issues that we're having here in America in that we don't address mental health as much as we should. Okay, We're having a major issue here where you have the, the mentally ill, you have the, the homeless population, um, and we just don't take care of the people that we should. I went to, I have a cousin in, in Canada, I got several cousins in Canada, and their health care system there addresses many aspects, um, <clears throat> including mental health. They take that very seriously over there. So what they do is, I mean, when I was driving around, they, they actually live in British Columbia. It's a beautiful place, beautiful place. And around every corner, you have mental health facilities, kind of like what we have Starbucks around here. They have those in around in every corner too, and they address it very well. They don't have uh, issues, they don't have a lot of issues with uh, the homeless like we do, okay? Because they take care of those who have um, big changes in their lives, they rehabilitate them and they reassimilate them back into society. Okay, so not big here, big in Canada. Okay, long-term residential facilities. These are health mental, and mental health, social and residential services provided to temporary or chronically disabled persons over an extended period of time to maintain as high as possible a level of independent functioning. So, <coughs> again, depending on the background of the individual who are residing at these facilities, the whole purpose is they offer all these different programs and services to get the individuals rehabilitated and get them from being dependent to independent. Okay? Then you have hospices. Are you guys familiar with hospices? Mm -hmm. Okay. Hospices is where you have patients going to die. Okay, that's the bottom line. There are they are terminally ill. There is no cure. So the goal has shifted from curing curing to palliative, palliative <coughs> treatment. In other words, we're trying to treat the symptoms, trying to make their lives as painless as possible for the next couple weeks, months, and hopefully years, okay? But hospices are usually those that are going to, uh, you know, are gonna pass away within a couple of weeks, maybe a month or so, very short term. <laughs> They, they exist if the, the, the families cannot tend to them because, you know, they're, they're working, they've got kids. Um, they basically have to put a stop, uh, a stop or put a hole in their life to care for their, their family. But this exists for, the, for those reasons. Now, when we're talking about hospice, are they only treating the ill? Who else are they dealing with at the hospices? Families. The family members. The family members, so they play a very important role in assuring that the families uh, are provided with what they need to get them through this difficult time. For anybody who works at hospices, 
you know, hospice, I think we were talking about radiation therapy before too. With hospices, it takes a special individual to work in this type of environment, okay? Because you know the person's gonna pass. So it's one of those, you, you either got, you got the temperament to do this or you don't. Again, it takes a special individual to do that. Um, my my ex-mother-in-law, uh, she passed away uh, years ago, but she used to work in a hospice. It was one of the things that she did, and she had the perfect personality for that because she was so bubbly, very outgoing, very enthusiastic, and she knew how to separate her her uh, her empathy and her sympathy, and also get on with her regular life. Um, just an amazing woman. All right, outpatient ambulatory care. These are medical care for individual patients provided by primary care and specialist physicians in their office or a clinic. So again, there's gonna be some overlap in a lot of things that we talk about here. Inpatient services, you're gonna be there overnight, maybe a, a day or two. But again, the job objective of these facilities is try to get them in and out as quickly as possible. All right? That also goes to long-term care. Now, Preventative care, that is where the shift is nowadays, is we try to tackle the issues before the patient gets admitted. Okay, it's preventative. We want to keep them away from healthcare facilities. All right, and if we provide them with enough education, if they are admitted to these healthcare facilities, it's only gonna be for a short time. The longer that they stay, the more resources that they use. So preventive care is a big thing. Educate healthy people in methods of maintaining their health and preventing illness. Home health care, home health care. You have the individuals living at home. So the services come to your residence. It can be for physical therapy. It can be for any type of home care services. When my dad was ill, um, this was a couple of years ago, He's doing really well right now, but when he was really ill, my mom, although she's strong, she could not do it on her own. So they had home care, home care services where they provided uh, physical therapy for my dad's rehabilitation. They had somebody also coming over to help, help him bathe, and among other things, helping, helping him with his walks. And so, um, I mean, this is, this is a great thing to do. And they, they also have noticed in studies that when the individual is being rehabilitated in their home, they rehabilitate faster than someplace that they're not very familiar or comfortable with. Okay, and the other aspect here is medicine or hospitals without walls. Hospitals without walls. We're talking about technology electronic digital transfer of images and information. We live in a world now where everything is, you know what they say with the, with the internet, it's made everything much smaller. They've made everything so much more accessible. So now the information can be transferred from one place to another simultaneously and immediately. Unlike before, unlike before where it took took a long while for information to be handed from one facility to the next. Now everything is done electronically. <coughs> okay, do we have any questions so far? Okay, different types of payments and reimbursement systems. How is it that we're going to pay for the services that are rendered to us? Number one, how many of you fall under the category of self-pay? Not anymore. How many of us can actually afford <laughs> self-care out of, out of our pockets? Can't even afford an aspirin at the hospital. You can't even do that, right? <laughs> but what's so funny is there are individuals who can do that. But I, I call them old money. You guys are, from, are you guys familiar with the city of Redlands? I think I've talked about Redlands before. <clears throat> Anybody know where Redlands is? Okay, so that's the, that's the base of where uh, San Bernardino is just right before you go up into, you know, the Big Bear, okay, Lake Arrowhead. 
I used to work, uh, I used to be a director at Buildings Community Hospital, and I was there for about a year. They have what you call there what's known as old money. You still have people residing there who live in two, three, four acres of land in a 5,000, 6,000 square foot home, apple trees, orchards, all around, and they still pay by cash. It amazed me that any time these people would come for a procedure, they'd be at the front desk paying cash or with a checkbook. You also see that in Newport <coughs> Beach, okay, with, the, with older residents. Okay, so self-pay, directly paid by the patient. All right, this is what we're more familiar with here is indemnity insurance. Indemnity insurance, they are the, the middle people, okay? Bills are paid by an insurance company or third party rather than the patient or healthcare agency themselves. When you have an insurance, it's kind of like a bank. This is where your money goes. You're, you're paying monthly for insurance in case something were to happen. You're essentially putting money aside, but you're giving it to the insurance company to do that. The catch is, for most of, most of the time, when you go to a hospital to get a service, you still have to front money before the insurance covers the rest of it. Okay? A deductible. Okay? So this is where indemnity insurance comes in. Okay? Aetna, Blue Cross, Health Net, okay, Kaiser. You guys are familiar with that, right? How many of you guys actually have insurance? Okay? Most of us do. Some of us don't. And we hope that we don't get sick. Um, but yeah, even insurance now has not become very affordable for a lot of individuals. All right, talk about the different uh, programs that are available out there. Entitlement government programs. These are terms that I'm sure you've heard. First one here is Medicare. Medicare is a nationwide health insurance to all persons, this is the criteria, all persons of 65 years of age of older, or to persons of any age with permanent kidney failure or permanent disability or illness. So we're talking about those in the latter years, but also who may be disabled and aren't able to uh, provide for themselves. Okay, some kind of disability. This is authorized under Title 18 of the Social Security Act. Basically what this is, is that it is a government-ran program based on this criteria, but it's also based on the type of services that you go for at hospital. This is known as a DRG. It's basically a flat rate. So you go in to the hospital with a certain type of, of symptoms, symptoms. The doctor makes a diagnosis. And based on his or her diagnosis, they will order a set of procedures to be conducted based, again, on your symptoms. Nothing more, nothing less. It's a DRG. An example of this would be, I'm going to make an analogy here, is going to McDonald's and getting a value meal. <coughs> okay? When you order a value meal, you get your Big Mac, okay, you get your fries, and you get a drink. All right? If you wanted something different, you'd order a different value meal, or you would order a Happy Meal. I like the Happy Meal because I get a, a nice toy with it. Okay? But it comes with that one package. If you want anything else, let's just say a la carte, you want something individual, now you have to pay extra for it. It's not part of the package. This is what a DRG is. So if you come in with a cough, they may order chest x-ray labs and some other types of tests, but it's under that one menu. Okay? Anything out of that menu, you have to pay out of pocket for it. It's based on the DRGs, which stands for Diagnostically Related Groups. Any more Anything excessive beyond that menu, you have to out of pocket it. Another good example of that is going to the car wash, right? You go to the car wash, you pick which one, which, which wash you want. There's usually three of them, usually three categories, right? And you pick the luxury wash. When you hear luxury wash, ooh, I'm going to get everything. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to get my tire polished. 
you have to pay extra for that. That's not under the luxury wash. Making sense? Okay, well, that's what a DRG is. All right, then you have Medicaid. Medicaid is a federally funded and state administered <coughs> program which provides medical care for families with dependent <coughs> older adults. Dependent is the key. They are dependent. They cannot be, they cannot function on their own. They are dependent. Dependent older adults, children or otherwise disabled persons with incomes below the federally, uh, federal poverty level. It also funds maternal and child care for the poor. Then you have TRICARE, which is 100% coverage for military or former military personnel. Okay. Managed care. <coughs> this goes back to the insurances. These health care programs under managed care are designed to control the cost. Here's the key again, control the cost. Control the cost of health care while meeting the patient's health needs. So this generally kicks in with someone needing long-term care. For an, exa an example of that with someone having cancer, okay? When you have cancer, I'm just gonna keep it general, when you have cancer, the hospital will assign you a case manager. That case manager it's usually a nurse. That case manager is going to generate a plan for you. Generate a plan for you to determine which services are going to best fit your needs. So it's gonna be services and doctors. So they will set the type of services and procedures you will need to help you along your way and also pick out your physicians. This is what a healthcare manager does, or a case manager. Now, if you decide that there is a certain service that you need, or there's a certain doctor that you wanna see that isn't part of what was put together by the case manager, it's gonna cost you some extra money. Don't you love our system? It's a great system, isn't it? So that's the way this works. All right. All right, let's talk about the hospital organization. The hospital organization, yes, we also have an organization because, as I had said before, it is a business. So you have a set of leaders from the very top to the middle to the bottom, and then you have your subordinates the people who carry out those orders. So at the very top, and I kind of look at this as our own, uh, our own government, at the very top you have the president, okay? And at the pre uh, from the top you have your president, then you have your vice presidents, and it's broken up to the different branches. You have the governors of each of the states, right? And as you get smaller, then you have the mayors of all the different cities. That's kind of how this organization works. So you got somebody at the top, which is your CEO or your president. Then it's broken up into subdivisions. So instead of like governors and mayors, you've got your vice presidents of different sections in your, in your hospital. And under these different sections, you have your different departments different divisions. So for example here you have your vice president of nursing services. Under nursing services it includes your home health, your house supervisors, your ambulatory services, your cardiovascular services, emergency services, and so on. You even got them for support services, operation, administration, <coughs> finance, education. And it's even broken up to more smaller branches as you make your way down this organizational chart. Where are we? Where are, where are we? Chief operating. You can't even see it. We're down here somewhere. Okay? Because we are the ones who carry out the orders from the top level. Now, when you look at this chart, here's the president or the CEO, but look who's on top of that. It is the people. 
you carry out, you can't carry out the orders unless there is a consensus of what needs to be done. So on top of the president and chief executive officer, you have the board of directors. The board of directors are people like you and I who have a stake with the hospital organization or the community. They are composed of lawyers, doctors, accountants, teachers, anything and everybody who has a stake at the hospital and a stake <coughs> in the community. They are the ones who set policies for the president or CEO to carry forward. Okay, so this is how it works. And then as you make your way down, if there's, if there's radiology services down here, here it's even broken down into more different branches. Okay, because you may have a chief operating officer, but now you'll have your director, you'll have your manager, your supervisor, and then you have your leads of all the different departments in radiology. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. <clears throat> but what is it that makes an organization? You will see this anytime you go to a hospital and you pick up a brochure about that hospital or if you go on the website, on the very left side where you have all the different links that you can click on, there's always going to be a link, a link there that says mission statement, philosophy, philosophy, vision, right? What this is, they are statements that legitimizes the business. It's what legitimizes the business. So what a philosophy is, it talks about what the firm is all about. Who are you? What are you about? What do you do? Why do you exist? And this is where the mission statement comes in. And the mission statement states exactly that. This is why we're here. Again, it legitimizes the business. And within this mission statement, it is going to be a list of things that affirms what this organization is all about. These statements may include detection and treatment of a disease. It may be for promotion of health. It may be for prevention of disease and rehabilitation. So it can be any or all of this. You can also talk about their role within the community and their commitment to education. But this is what a mission statement is all about. <coughs> Okay, here's the governing board. Remember the previous slide? Board of trustees, board of governors, it's all the same thing. Okay, they're individuals, and it can be anybody from any walks of life that has a stake in the operation of that hospital and the community. We have the same organizational chart here on campus. Okay. I'm, again, somewhere down here in the bottom. My boss is the director of radiology and ultrasound. We report to the dean. You guys are familiar with deans, right? When you hear that dean, the word dean, it's a pretty high administrative uh, position, but there's even someone more powerful above the dean. Above the dean, you have your president and your vice president, and then you have your chancellor and your vice chancellor of this area, and then you also have a chancellor of the entire state. But who is it that we still have to answer to? The board of directors. Every month, we have a meeting. We call it town hall, but it's actually the, the main campus over there at, at Anaheim, where they have these meetings and an auditorium where you have all these big wigs there. But the one who is leading <coughs> the meeting are the board of directors. And they're all different different people within the community of Anaheim, Cypress, La Palma, anybody here in Orange County. And we have to answer to them. Who checks these people? Are they you have to be elected. Um, who, who checks them? I mean, this is because of check and balance, right? It's about checks and balances. So before you even get put in that position, they also have to run for election. So, you know, there's a group of them who puts themselves in the ballot with their history and their background. And it's usually word of mouth. This is how you, um, because you can't just let any strangers in there. So they're in, enters themselves in the ballot, and it's, a, it's kind of a, on a popularity vote. And that's who, who we let in as board of directors. And it, it freaks me out because it's, uh, 
I know they're just regular people, but sometimes they'll be walking in through the class and I get all nervous because they're the ones on the very top and I don't want to piss them off. They're the ones who, get, who, who provides my paycheck, actually. 